Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Minchev. As we move into the hotter and drier months here in California, climate change is at the forefront of our minds because we're thinking about how hot it is and how much more likely we are to be hot thanks to climate change. We're talking about wildfires, thinking about how much more prone we are there. Our insurance crisis has to do with climate change and that is the focus of today's conversation. Take a look. I'm joined on the program today by Caitlin Trudeau, uh, Senior Research Associate uh, on Climate at Climate Central. Caitlin, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let me ask you, what is Climate Central? So Climate Central is a nonprofit group of journalists and scientists who are researching the impacts of climate change, the solutions, and then communicating them to the public, policymakers, and I guess everyone who's interested. And I've, uh, you guys also make graphics that we use on air. So if yes. you watch ABC 10 or even uh, if you're not in the Sacramento area watching somewhere else, you've probably seen some of the work uh, that Climate yes. Central has yeah, put out. Yeah, we've got a Climate Matters program that works with journalists, team meteorologists, to produce TV-ready graphics and localized climate data about every week, uh, telling different stories. So, Because messaging is half the battle. It's with important. Climate more, maybe more than half the battle yeah. at this point. Okay, so today I want to cover a few topics. Uh, mm -hmm. Heat. Uh, and fire especially, yes. uh, two of the things that I, I want to talk to you about. So let's start with heat. Mm -hmm. um, we're now moving uh, into summer. Uh, yeah, just, you know, at the time of this recording, we're coming up on our first triple digit days of the year. Yes. Uh, excessive heat warnings are posted for much of the Central Valley. Um, and this is only becoming worse, more frequent. We have hotter days. Uh, more often. Yeah, definitely. Um, average temperatures in Sacramento have risen by 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit um, and across all of California and actually the country. Um, you know, so it, it's definitely getting warmer. We're seeing more summer days above normal. Um, and we're also seeing a, a large increase in uh, nighttime summer temperatures. And the nighttime lows are in some ways even more dangerous than the, the afternoon highs. Like we're out working when it's 105, but we also need that time to recover at night Absolutely. when the temperatures drop into the 50s, 60s. Absolutely, yeah. And so, I mean, sleep is really important. Um, and so we're seeing really drastic increases in heat throughout the night, um, which has a lot of health impacts. Um, so it's, it's really not, um, it's not a good thing, um, but it's something that was predicted with climate change. And I think something that's somewhat unique to California, but also parts of New England, parts of the Pacific Northwest, um, don't have air conditioner, right? Um, the Pacific exactly. Northwest especially, uh, a lot of cities, a lot of houses don't have widespread AC just because mm -hmm. they haven't traditionally needed it. Uh, San Francisco, a lot of the mm -hmm. California coast, a lot of the, the high country, the Sierra, sometimes don't have uh, mm -hmm. AC. And I think this is interesting because nighttime lows over the last 50 years uh, in San Francisco have warmed by three degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just overnight mm -hmm. in the summertime. Uh, in Sacramento, that number is a little less, but it's still 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit on average in the summertime. So that means our nights are warmer and we're not seeing that recovery in San Francisco. Uh, 55 degrees, uh, nights above 55 degrees plus 80 uh, just over the last right. 50 years, which is huge. Right, yeah. I mean, a lot of people know our days are getting hotter, but really our night times are warming tremendously. Um, and so I think it's something that can be easily overlooked. Um, but you're right, not everyone has air conditioning. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of schools recently have to shut down because they don't have air conditioning. They have to send kids home because it's too hot. Um, and, and as it gets hotter, um, it, we're going to have to, you know, increase the amount of money we're spending to cool ourselves uh, on air conditioning. Our heating and cooling costs are going to increase. Which can impact our electric grids as well Absolutely. and our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, powering those grids and the generators. Um, I, I, how can we attribute, though, and this is one of the things that Climate Central does really well, is the attribution mm -hmm. science. How can we say that because we're gonna be, say, 105 one day, that it's being made more likely by climate change? So what we can do is we can use models and observations. I mean, basically what we do is we create a counterfactual world, a world where we didn't emit carbon dioxide, a world where we didn't have an industrial revolution, and we compare the probability of temperatures in the counterfactual world compared to what we see now. And so we look at the difference between that. How much more likely are these temperatures in our world compared to how they would have been if we hadn't um, polluted so much carbon. And so that gives us an idea, say, you know, maybe we have 100, 100 degree days in the summertime, but prior we had two or three. And so we can say that the likelihood of... Right, yeah, so it depends, you know, it depends on the day, it depends on the area. Um, but what we can do with this attribution method is basically 
tell you on any given day how much more likely your temperatures were made because of human-caused climate change, which is really remarkable because that was not possible, um, you know, not too far far in the past. And so it's, it's, it's really incredible to start doing this with temperature. Um, we're, we're looking into doing this for sea surface temperature as well and hopefully doing more attributions for different variables in the future. And the ways we can use this data, um, we can also say like fire, right? Fire weather days are becoming more common uh, in this world that has climate change occurring. Uh, I know you do a lot of research in mm -hmm. fire. You're from uh, this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so tell me what some of your research has been on recently. Yeah, so we've been looking at um, the frequency of fire, fire weather days. These are hot, dry, windy days where the weather conditions just really prime the landscape for extreme fire behavior. These aren't necessarily days with fire. They're just days that should a fire break out, um, you know, it's likely to grow and become much more severe of a fire than if conditions were otherwise. So we took a look at how frequently we see this fire weather um, about over the last 50 years across the country. And we've seen just widespread increases in fire weather days, specifically across the West and Southwest. There are some parts of the Southwest that see an additional two more months of fire weather days now compared to the 70s. Um, so, so we're really seeing a dramatic increase. And, you know, again, it doesn't mean there's fires, but it does put you at risk for a lot of other things. You can think of fire weather as a threat multiplier, um, but these kinds of conditions are also what utility companies monitor for when they have to decide whether it's appropriate to issue a public safety power shutoff. So, you know, you, there might not be a fire and you might lose your power because fire weather is present. Um, so it, it's something that's really important to take a look at because the more that we see these really dangerous fire weather days, the fewer days we have to do things like prescribed burning, which is really important um, because it's too dangerous to start fires when it's really hot, dry, and windy. Um, so it, it's really going to be something we're going to have to think about as a society. How do we move forward and continue to do things like prescribed burning, which we desperately need to do, but also keep our communities and our, you know, our, our cities safe. And so in the Sacramento Valley, uh, plus 13 days, mm -hmm. Uh, is how many uh, fire weather days we're seeing since 1973. So over the last 50 years, mm -hmm. we're averaging an additional 13 days. That's almost two weeks yes. of fire weather days. Again, fire doesn't happen every day, but it just means our, our window, if you will, is much bigger than it was. Right, yes. Yeah, these are expanding, and even in the San Joaquin Valley area, just you know, south of us, um, they're seeing an additional two more weeks of fire weather days compared to the 70s. So basically stretching throughout the Central Valley, we're seeing you know, these big increase in, in fire weather days and just dangerous conditions. Um, you know, it, it's just all you need is one lightning strike, all you need is one spark to start a fire that's going to really grow out of control. And these days, are they are we seeing more days in the summertime, more days in the fall, or is it kind of evenly split across all four seasons? It, it, yeah, it depends on where you are. Um, what we saw generally in the West, in the Pacific Northwest, is summer's really seen um, most of the fire weather days, most of the increase in fire weather. Um, if you look to the Southwest, it's, it's interesting to see a huge increase in the springtime. Um, and, and that's true of some parts in California as well. Um, which is particularly concerning because that is usually when we try to do things like prescribed burning. And it was just only a couple of years ago where uh, New Mexico was doing some prescribed burning in the spring and it, the weather conditions picked up and it turned into the state's largest fire in state history. And you touched on New Mexico mm -hmm. uh, with that fire. That prescribed burn that got out of control actually mm -hmm. caused the U.S. Forest Service to stop doing prescribed burns for a while, and that also can set us back. So it's not just when a prescribed burn goes well, but also when it goes bad, it can be yeah. a problem. Absolutely, yeah, and it's really difficult because we're seeing more of these fire weather conditions during one of the very few times of year where it's actually safe to do these kinds of prescribed burns, and the weather can change really quickly. I mean, they might forecast that the conditions are okay and things might pick up, and all of a sudden it's not okay. Um, so it's something we really have to be careful with and, and watch moving into the future because we know it's going to keep getting warmer and we know it's going to keep getting a lot, a lot drier in the southwest and the west as well. So it's something we're going to have to think about how to do safely. Uh, and, and so let's talk a little bit more generally about climate change now mm -hmm. because it's not just the heat and the fire, but um, all of these are starting to compound, which mm -hmm. scientists, scientists have said for a while now that it's not just one event or two events. Right. We're going to start seeing this kind of snowball. Uh, 2023 was the hottest year on record and all of the hottest years on record globally have happened within the last 
10, 15 years, basically since 2010. Right, yeah, I think the hottest nine of 10 years have happened basically in the last, uh, you know, basically since 2010. Um, so, so it's really um, a remarkable thing to see the hottest year on record and to see so many extreme weather events all around the world. Um, and, and, you know, the number of days between these events is decreasing. Um, so it's really reducing our capacity to prepare and address um, these issues and, and keep our communities safe, um, keep our neighborhoods and our, our um, neighbors, you know, prepared. And you touched on that, uh, the number of days between disasters increasing. Uh, Climate Central has done research and the, the, there's less time mm -hmm. over the last 50 years. And we kind of use 50 years as a benchmark, right, 1970s, when we really started to see a lot of those right. greenhouse gases. Start. The, the, the time in between disasters is actually from 1980 because that's NOAA billion dollar disaster data, which did start in the 1980s. But yeah, it's, it's been, you know, short, that time period is shortening and shortening. Less and, than 20 days now on average. Yes, yeah, so it's about, I think it's about 12 to 13 days now in between billion dollar disasters on average, um, you know, which is really remarkable um, and really scary. And, you know, last year was really dramatic for a lot of places around the world. Um, you know, we're waiting to see how this year goes with the summer. Um, but, you know, it, it's a little scary, yeah. And that has impacts too on, on, you know, even if we don't see some of the disasters like flooding in the southeast or hurricanes or whatever it may be, um, that has an impact on insurance companies. And so Absolutely. rates go up not, over, not only over there, but over here in California as well, something that we're dealing with because of all the mm -hmm. fires that we've seen. Absolutely. And people, they lose their insurance. It becomes almost impossible to get insurance. Insurance companies pull out. We're seeing this in, you know, in the West for fires, but people have been seeing this in Florida with hurricanes. Um, you know, in, in the Midwest, um, you know, with flooding, it, they're, it's getting to a point where it's becoming too expensive for insurance companies to insure us, which is a really huge problem because we know these disasters are going to continue to happen. And so if people can't get insurance, what are they going to do when, you know, hundreds, thousands of people lose their home in a hurricane or, or a wildfire, you know, we really need to be thinking about what are we going to do at that point and how are we going to be able to help people in our communities. And unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of um, denial out there that's mm -hmm. still happening um, uh, on a state level scale. Florida just recently said that climate change can no longer be accounted for when planning for the future, when uh, making investments, whatever it may be. And yet that state maybe just as much as California, if not more, is on the front lines of mm -hmm. climate change from extreme weather and flooding to rising seas as well. Um, how, how, do we, how do we move forward, right? I mean, we have to prepare, we have to take yeah. into account. Uh, this is not just uh, here in the United States either, it's everywhere, it's globally. Right, yeah, it kind of leaves you at a loss thinking about that because it's almost just unfathomable how you could make those decisions. But, you know, we're, we're not, um, trying to cook anything up. We're looking at the science and we're looking at facts. And when you look at the science and when you look at facts, you see that our planet is warming at an unprecedented rate, a um, rate we haven't seen in over 2,000 years. And, um, you know, that cannot be denied. And I guess you could try to close your eyes and close your ears, um, but the world around you is changing and we're going to have to decide are we going to be prepared or are we just going to pretend this isn't happening. Um, so I, I hope we choose to be prepared um, because these, we know these events are going to continue to happen. And, b and before we move forward, I do want to ask, how do we know that the world is changing at a rate we haven't seen in 2,000 years or more? I mean, yes. obviously, we didn't have thermometers right. 2,000 years ago. How, how do we get this data? Right. So we have the observational record, which is, you know, where we use thermometers and weather stations um, to look at, you know, our temperatures. But when you go farther back, there are different things you can use called proxies. <clears throat> and so these are kind of natural thermometers you can think of. These are things like ice cores, tree rings, lake sediments. All these things record temperature inside them with different isotopes. And so what we can do is we can use those natural proxies to extend um, our time series of climate back millions of years, um, which is really remarkable. They can take an ice core from Antarctica and actually melt the ice core and get the little bubbles and analyze the air in those little bubbles. And so you're basically analyzing historic air. Um, and so that has actually allowed us to know so much more about our climate, so much more about what's natural, what we've seen before in the past and it goes back millions and millions of years. Um, so, you know, that's something that's been really great to have because that's how we do know. 
So where do we go from here? Uh, I mean, you know, this, a lot of this has been a, a little bit of doom and gloom, and I know mm -hmm. there's certainly uh, a lot of folks out there that are concerned and that are worried, but I mean, you kind of reach a certain point where fear paralyzes, right? So where, where's the silver lining? What's the good news? What can we take away from, from this conversation and say, this is how we move forward? Right. Well, you know, climate change is a very heavy topic. As someone that talks about it every day, thinks about it every day, it, it's difficult to, to address what's happening and to deal with the fact that so many people are pretending that it's not. Um, and, and so it is hard, but I think that there's, it's not like there's hope lost. I think that there are a lot of solutions. Um, you know, when you think about wind and solar, um, it's never been cheaper, it's never been more accessible. Um, there are so many options in terms of different kinds of solutions, what people can do, what governments can do, what communities can do, what corporations can do. Um, you know, when there's a huge problem, most of the time you, you don't know what's causing it or how to solve it. And with this one, we do know what's causing it, and we do know how to solve it. Um, and so I think, you know, it can be really overwhelming to turn on the news, to deal with all that's going on in the world right now, and then especially on top of that, think about the next big wildfire, next big hurricane, next big flood. Um, you know, people are just trying to get through the day. Um, but, but I think that we kind of forget how much, like, power we have as, as a group and as individuals ourselves. But... You know, this year it's it's um it's an election year, and so you know, one thing we should all be doing is participating and you know voting for the things they believe in, um and because you know it's it's an important year. So, I, I really do have hope for the future. I do have hope um, for all the people around the world that are working so hard trying to find more solutions, trying to inform people what's happening, trying to get people on board and find you know a better way forward. Um, we really need that, and so I, I think that um, just kind of leaning on that and just, I mean, we're going to need to do it all together as a community. So um, hopefully we can, you know, move forward in a, in a positive direction. And California's kind of always been a leader in mm -hmm. this fight. Um, like I said a few minutes ago, we're kind of on the front lines Absolutely. from all sides. Um, so, you know, even in a, in a year with budget deficits and a lot mm -hmm. of tough decisions to make, climate should still be at the forefront. Absolutely. I mean, the, the thing is, will it be expensive? Yes. But it will never be cheaper than it is right, than it is, address it than it is right now. Um, and, and so we can either be prepared or we cannot be prepared. But whether we acknowledge it or not, um, these things are coming. And so I think, you know, it's important for us to remember that um, we are a part of nature. We can't separate ourselves from that. And so the things that we do affect the nature around us and what happens in nature affects us. Um, so we really can't separate ourselves out from that. So, Caitlin, thank you so much for stopping by today. Yeah. Fantastic work that you and the team at Climate Central do. Thank and you so much. We'll be in touch. Thanks.